And we are back here <clears throat> after a few technical difficulties. We are back with live stream number 26, streaming from the Connecticut River Delta through the finest internet in the land. And we are here. And Beginner Guitar Lessons is here. He is our moderator. And he is here to help us with our chat, our live chat. Beginner Guitar Lessons, I hope you're doing great tonight. Happy Saturday night. We're in a new studio here in a small town, Connecticut. And if you listen closely during tonight's live stream, you may hear the sound of a traditional holiday parade happening in the streets below. We are on the second story of our uh, new Elm Street studio. And I see we have multiple viewers viewing. Thank you, everybody. In case some of you tuned in and didn't find us exactly when you expected to, I am so grateful you're here today. So uh, let's get right down to it. The Wi-Fi is working great. The camera's working great. The microphone is working great. Uh, kinks have been worked out. So I want to say hello to Jerry Stilwell. Hello to Jim from Winnipeg. Uh, don't forget, you guys, we are here for your questions. So let's get those questions coming in. Uh, put a few question marks in advance of your questions. That is how I know. <laughs> That is how I know you are aiming a question at me. Uh, I do have in my hands here an agenda, uh, I, meaning uh, plenty of things that I have on my mind, things I'm happy to talk about until we get to your questions. Crotchety old geezer. Hello. Stephen Smith from Lee's Summit, Missouri. You guys know I love, uh, I love knowing where you're from. Walter, hello. Uh, so my friends, here's some things that we're going to do today in between your questions. I want to get you guys up to speed on the new publication, my newest ebook, The Song Bike Blues Guide. I can't wait to show you more about The Song Bike Blues Guide. I can't wait to show you more about the complete Christmas songbook. I have a, uh, I have a dumb question of the week. Don't forget, there's a portion of the show where I encourage you guys to ask your dumbest questions. Things that you might think, uh, should I say this? And of course, the answer is yes. And I'll let you know <clears throat> in a little while. We'll open up the floor to dumb questions. And I have a great dumb question to get us started. Other things, I have a few philosophical things to throw your way. Uh, a little storytelling to throw your way. And, uh, and of course, we have our regular feature, which is our play along, sing along. I have a two chord song for you, a song that I actually didn't know was only two chords, and, uh, and now I do know it's a two-chord song, so I can't wait to play that one with you guys. Okay, uh, <laughs> A to Z me. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience. I'm ironing out a few kinks. That's all right. That's all right. Um, I, no one is more frustrated than I am, <laughs> but, um, you know, when things don't happen like clockwork, but... Uh, Trust me when I say we are ironing, ironing these things out. So, hey, everybody. Um, so, uh, let's get right into it. Let's talk about this blues guide. At the moment, the quickest way for you to get your hands on the ebook, remember, this is an electronic book, uh, even though it looks like a real, it looks like I'm holding up a paper book. Um, it's an ebook for you guys, but you can just print it out, print out one page at a time, print out uh, um, the whole thing. This is a short, sweet little book jam-packed with fun stuff. So I'll give you an example of where I'm coming from in this blues guide. Oh, by the way, uh, how do you get a copy of it? Well, between now and uh, Christmas, anybody who purchases the Christmas songbook gets a free blues guide. At some point, I will you know, make this available you know, independently of the Christmas book. But right now, that's the way to get it. Okay, so what is this blues guide we're talking about? Okay, so I'm going to crack it open to, uh, um, how about, yeah, how about the, um, oh, so much good stuff in here. Okay, how about the, uh, 
How about the G blue scale in the closed position? What does that mean? I will show you. The G blue scale in the closed position and a corresponding riff that put your, your scale skills to use. Okay, so you crack open the book to page 11. We introduce the notion of the G blue scale third position. For those of you keeping track, my index fingers on three. There's the first octave, second octave. Throw a little bonus note, and then we work our way back down. One more octave. A little bonus note. Back to our G note. Okay, so what's going on there? The idea is you get warmed up on the scale. Down up picking with your right hand, right? Don't neglect to go back down. Practice descending as much as you practice ascending, right? Here's descending. I'm gonna check my notes. Where are we doing here? There we go. Practice what I preach, okay? Doing it low to high is great, an equal amount high to low. Okay, the G blue scale in closed position, no open strings, right? Okay, then you do that, you get your fingers warmed up, down up, picking with your picking hand, right? Always alternate, down up, down up. Then, okay, let's put it to use. A classic blues riff uh, from the song Tore Down. <laughs> Also known as I'm Tore Down. Made famous by Freddie King, but recorded by countless people. Okay, so I'm Tore Down uses this riff based on the G blues scale in the closed position. That's not the entire song, but you got to be able to do that if you want to play the rhythm guitar part for the entire song. So get the idea? A scale to get you warmed up. And then a famous riff that uses that scale. And there's a bunch of pages just like this. The key of F, the key of A, the key of E, and so on. I think last time we were together, I illustrated this in the key of E, right? Okay. So, uh, by the way, I made it a point in the Blues Guide to break the scales specifically into octaves, meaning... <laughs> You know, and then there's a line, like, okay, there's one octave, and then, right? So that you begin to hear the value of each note, right? All those notes have their own value, and uh, no note has more value than the root note, in this case, G. And that high G right there. Okay, so you want to train your ear to, to give value to each note especially the root notes. Here's the good news. Those of you who are adults and you've been listening to music your whole life, you are already, you've already done this. You've already, you recognize so much information. Now we're giving it names such as root note, you know, blue scale, stuff like that. But you recognize this stuff because you've heard music for decades, right? Okay, so that's an example of page 11 in my blues guide. How do you get a copy? Stephen Smith says, what page? Page 11. Okay, head on over to Songbike, www.song-bike.com. There it is in the, uh, in the chat. Um, and order yourself a copy of the complete Christmas songbook, which we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, you know. Uh, and then you, it's available as an immediate download, right? It's an ebook. So as soon as you order it, it comes right to your email address. And uh, the blues guide is attached, okay, for free. So in case anybody has a blue Christmas, you got I got you covered with the blue the blues guide, the song bike blues guide. My first blues book. I never did a blues book before uh, until now, and I look forward to doing more and expanding on the ideas. Oh, just so you know, uh, other features of the blues guide include shuffle patterns. Very important. Uh, a bunch of um, a bunch of classic blues turnaround phrases. There's five of those, uh, and just a bunch of a bunch of famous tunes, including 
uh, Manish Boy, Little Red Rooster, Boom Boom, Smokestack Lightning, I'm Your Hoochie Coochie Man. In some cases, the riff is the whole tune. The riff that you learn is, is the whole tune. In other cases, like with Tore Down, it's a riff that you have to master if you want to play the rest of the tune. You know, it's the riff that sort of is the heart of the tune. Okay. Thanks for listening to my sales pitch. <clears throat> Beginner guitar lesson says you look super clear. Not too clear, I hope. But clear enough, right? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, uh, hey, Stephen Mannion. Thanks for, for finding us here. William Fox, hello from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, William, I'm guessing it is a different time. You know, here in Connecticut, we're looking at about six o'clock. So um, you're up late, right? Uh, right, William. Thanks for, thanks for being here, William. All the way from Dublin, Ireland. I hope to visit someday. Okay, so uh, let me throw a philosophical thing at you guys. Um, I like doing this because um, uh, how you see your progress and how you see your approach to the guitar how you define your approach to the guitar is really significant and it's probably unique to you, or at least it's something that's, that's worth talking about. Um, so here's what I want you guys to think about. Learning music versus getting good at the guitar. Where do you fall in that spectrum? Let's say learning music, you know, as a, as a concept, right? That's way over here. And getting good at the physical skills that you need to play the guitar is way over here we all fall somewhere along that spectrum, right? You can, you can, um, you can learn a lot about music reading a book with, without a guitar anywhere in sight, right? You can work on your physical skills and get really great physical skills without, without um, a big knowledge of music theory, right? Um, nothing, wrong, nothing wrong with working on your physical skills. Most of us fall somewhere in the spectrum. So where do you fall? How important is it to you to understand how music works, to know how people write songs, to know how people conceive of a guitar solo before they play it or in the moment that they're playing it. How important is that versus purely just getting the F chord to sound good, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm guessing that a lot of us um, out here, uh, that we're so overwhelmed by the physical skills, you know, the, especially the physical skills that we have not mastered yet. That that's really what we think about when we sit down. You know, we're not analyzing what an F chord means to the universe. We're working on uh, getting the right angle, you know, or bar chords, or or how about um? I was talking to one of my in-person students today about the five pentatonic patterns that get you up and down the neck, right? And he's he's got those patterns. He's working on those patterns, basically getting them memorized. And he asked me about, what about switching between the patterns, smoothly flowing from one pentatonic pattern to another, right? That's where he's coming from. So that is, you know, a physical skill. Um, so anyway, something for you guys to think about. Learning music as, a, as an art form, right? Versus getting good at the guitar. Uh, sometimes you're in a position where one of them is just where your head is at. You're on, a, you're on an airplane. But you have a book with you, a, a book that somehow relates to guitar, music theory, you name it. So at that moment, you are pretty much focusing on learning music. Then again, if you manage to grab an hour on a Saturday afternoon and, and you have an hour to spend just you and your guitar, yeah, then it's going to be time to work on those physical skills, right? Um, you might make that choice. Hey, Robert from Queens, New York. Uh, Jerry Stillwell, I see your question and I'm going to answer it right now. Jerry Stillwell asks a question that Name drops one of my favorite guitar people, Jerry Stillwell, asks, what do you think of Fred Sokolow's blues book? I have a couple of them. One is pretty old. I love Fred Sokolow or Fred Sokolow. Um, yeah, anything. He's, he's one of my, I learned a lot from him, without a doubt. And I'm sure when I write books on my own, I'm sure I'm, I'm, some of what I do you know, echoes his style a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, so yeah, I recommend any of his books. And if you have some old ones, that's great because it's possible some of his stuff is out of print. Um, or it's possible that you just have a cool old copy of something that is very much in print, but you have a cool old copy of it. <clears throat> uh, anything, anything written by him. I'm pretty sure he's done stuff beyond blues. Um, 
I know I have a Chuck Berry, um, you know, transcription book from him. Um, so yeah, anything by Fred. Other authors that come to mind where I would advise you guys to get anything by that by that author. Um, well, good old Greg Koch. I'm going to put his name in the link. You can't go wrong with um, anything that he writes. Uh, who else? Um, good old uh, Arlen Roth. How about Stefan Grossman? I know I'm forgetting. Uh, oh my gosh, maybe the number one. I'm putting his name in the chat too. Dave Rubin. Holy cow, do I own a bunch of Dave Rubin books? I can't go wrong with anything by Dave Rubin. Um, uh, so, so um, I recommend uh, anything by those guys. Um, and, and, and I would go as far as to say, judge the book by its cover or by its title. You know, if, if one of those guys wrote a book and the title seems like something you're interested in, just grab it, just grab it. Don't, don't waste too much time. Any book by any one of those names, uh, you're, you're going to learn some good stuff from that. Interestingly, depending on the age of the book, there may be little or no, um, audio that comes with it you know so just be on the lookout you know buyer beware if you're the kind of guitar student who you really want a video with a book or at a minimum you want an audio example in some form you know triple check before you invest in one of those books because it might not depending on the exact situation it might not come you know with a, a video or something like that um if it's a brand new publication it almost certainly does but uh, it might not. So, so Jerry, I say um, enjoy every one of Fred's books that you have, and I recommend it. <clears throat> um, Stephen, you're commenting on the quality. Well, <laughs> I went from a double-digit uh, internet speed at my uh, music shop to triple-digit internet speed here in, I'm going to call this my Elm Street studio, rising <laughs> rising two stories above scenic Elm Street. My friends, uh, here in uh, small town Connecticut, there is a holiday parade happening on the streets. And I, I was actually hoping there'd be some noise and commotion. Um, uh, I don't hear any, and I guess you don't either. I think I'm just off the beaten path. So the noise, and well, the night is young. I'm hoping that... Uh, that there will be some, because, you know, it gives it a little character. You want some character? I'll give you guys some character. Watch this. Anybody out there? Hello? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, how about this? Oh, oh no, you're, you're too kind. You're too kind. Uh, buttons. I have buttons at my disposal, you know. Remember when the live stream got off to a bad start? I know, I know. But we're back. I know, I know. Yeah. Buttons. Don't let me near buttons. Don't ever let me near buttons like that. Okay. <laughs> uh, a to Z me is asking A to Z me. You're saying it's a dumb guitar question. It's not a dumb guitar question. It's a great question. Let's get to A to Z me's question. Uh, what's the best sitting position, including what chair should you use, etc.? My number one, my, my number one, uh, recommendation and and you guys know this you can't sit anywhere where there's arms on the chair right uh i you know why do they why do they even put arms on chairs don't they know us guitar players would, would can never ever use those chairs um so yeah so so obviously nothing with arms um but what you're what you're what i want to talk about is what you're you know the sitting position great question in fact i was just talking about this today with a student saturdays you guys i teach um eight or nine private lessons. Uh, today, in this case, they're all in-person lessons, not um, any online lessons. So I have a lot of stuff fresh in my brain, um, including talking about sitting position. Uh, don't underestimate or rule out the possibility of playing the guitar with your left foot on a, some sort of footrest. Now, this is assuming you're a right-handed guitar player. Your left foot a, you know, a few inches off the ground, and the guitar resting on your left leg, right? Essentially, a classical guitar position. Um, I don't do that, but I make one exception. Some of you guys might remember 
I found when I'm playing slide guitar, where's my slide? I got my slide around here somewhere. When I'm playing slide guitar, um, I, I, just, I just plain play better when my left foot is up on something and my guitar is resting on my left leg, basically the way a classical guitar player would play it. Um, most of us just take our guitar and jam it down on our right leg, and that's how you see everyone do it, assuming that you're sitting down. So nothing wrong with that. It's great. People have done it for years. It's, that's how we all see each other playing the guitar, right? Assuming you're sitting down. But, um, uh, oh, Stephen, you're making a good point. Strap. Let's talk about that for a second. <clears throat> a strap is a great idea, even if you're sitting down. Um, guitars can be slippery, especially you got a, a thin little, you know, Stratocaster. Any, you know, guitars today that finishes electric guitars, so smooth, so slick, right? Um, they can get slippery. A strap is a great idea, even if you're sitting down. Plus, it's a chance to make a fashion statement. As you know, there's a million straps out there, so many different designs and you name it, materials. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend a strap, even if you're sitting down. Uh, if your guitar does not have a strap button anywhere, you know, in the vicinity of the neck, hopefully it has one on the, over here, on the um, lower bout, you know, the butt of the guitar. If it does not have one somewhere on the neck, don't worry. Um, there's, you can either, either install it yourself um, or you can, you can put a shoelace through your strap and then tie the shoelace right under the strings behind the nut, past the nut. That works out great. Diodario makes a cool device that um, with a, uh, a clip. I, I don't have it at my disposal right now, but it's a cool um, way to adapt any strap to the headstock of your guitar without any need to drill in. Okay, so getting back to um, the sitting position, if it's worth experimenting with getting your left foot up on something and resting the guitar on your left leg. If it doesn't work for you, no harm done. Um, you know, an old Yellow Pages phone book, um, anything stable. You can spend 20 bucks on a, an official guitar rest through, um, through good old uh, Sweetwater. Um, in fact, I'm going to put Sweetwater in the chat here. Um, but uh, what do I want to say? Um, it's worth experimenting, especially if, if for some reason you're not 100% comfortable having the guitar on your right leg. Of the many advantages to having the guitar up on your left leg, check out my sight lines here. All of a sudden, I can, I can see what's going on in my left hand just that much closer right the proximity it's right there so um now standing up <laughs> uh i definitely re recommend practicing standing up number one for the novelty of it right just you know stretch your back out play standing up it, it breaks up the practice routine right number two if there's ever a possibility you're ever going to uh, actually play standing up perform standing up you have to get used to it as soon as possible. If it's likely or possible that you're gonna perform standing up at some point, a significant portion of your practice time has to be standing up. Don't, it's so disorienting to practice week after week sitting down and then suddenly try to play standing up. You, you're gonna feel like you took 10 steps backwards. So yeah, that's my advice there. <clears throat> um, in terms of the chair, A to Z, me, whatever you do, don't get comfy on your sofa. Don't lean back. I know it feels so good to lean back and play. And uh, don't, don't do it. Um, uh, you got to play sitting up, you know, with as, as good posture as you can muster. Okay, I'm going to bring up a sensitive subject. Okay. Your gut. Some of you have a gut. <laughs> okay. And uh, since I, most of you I don't know personally, um, I'm not singling anybody out, but, uh, and hey, David Crosby had a gut and he managed to play the guitar. If you have a tummy, uh, and it changes your relationship to the guitar, it just does. Um, it makes, I'm not, I don't wanna say it makes things harder, but it doesn't make things easier. I, I've worked with students where the guitar is, is away from their body, and they, their left arm has to, has to deal with that distance. 
And then, of course, seeing the instrument is a little bit trickier too. So no judgment here whatsoever, but I just want to acknowledge that it, it's, I know that it's, it makes things a little bit trickier if you can't get the guitar as, you know, as close as possible to your face and your chin. So do I have any great advice? Um, I don't. David Crosby seemed to, to work it out. Um, but I figured I'd mention it because, okay, it's a reality, right? It's, it's the world we live in. You know, that's, we're all working with our anatomy the way it is at the moment. Um, but those of you who have some kind of tummy going on, um, it's, you know, I, I, I get that it's, it changes things a little bit. You especially may have to think about your, your posture, your seat, you know, your, your, the chair you're sitting in and so on, you know. Um, Okay, uh, so let's see here. Um, beginner guitar lessons asked a great asks a great question. What makes a minor scale minor? Uh, flatted third, flatted sixth, flatted seventh. There's the math that's involved. Um, and for some of you, you're like, got it. Flat three, flat six, flat seven. Um, I'm going to illustrate it though with an A minor scale and you know what i might do because i love visual stuff and i have not only do i have blank paper uh, i have my two favorite things a pen and paper okay so i'm going to write i'm the reason i'm using an a major scale and an a minor scale as my reference point is well you'll see Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm holding up for the camera here. The notes, the eight notes of an A major scale. Really, it's seven notes because the final A is just a note that vibrates at exactly twice the frequency of the first A. And so we consider it the same note. Mathematically, they're related. Scientifically, musically, they are related, even though, of course, it's twice as the sound is higher, right? Okay, the seven notes of an A major scale. By the way, the word octave. O C T A V E octave, you know, it's the eighth note. That distance is known as an octave. Interestingly, it's 12 frets on the guitar, right? If you're, you know, if you play the first fret and then you jump up 12 frets to the 13th fret, right? You've jumped 12 frets, but we call that an octave. Ooh, the first time I thought about that, it freaked me out for a minute. Like, wait a minute, how could 12 frets be an octave? Oct means eight. Ooh, it freaked me out. <laughs> like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I should know, like, why does this never cross my mind before? Um, that's because the word octave is a little bit deceptive. Oct doesn't mean eight frets. It means the eighth note of, in this case, of the major scale. Okay, so the question was, what makes a minor scale minor? And like everything, everything in music, we always use major scales as a reference point. You could ask, you know, how did the Beatles write Eleanor Rigby? And some joker like me is going to say, well, you take a major scale, and everything always comes back to major scales. Like, as a teacher said to me, that's why it's called major, major, the major scale. Everything relates back to a major scale. Okay, so the A major scale. We take that A major scale, and we're going to do three things. We're going to flat the third note. We're going to flat the sixth note. We're going to flat the seventh note. Again, here it is visually. I'm going to underline the third note. Okay, the sixth and the seventh. So take a good look. Okay, an A major scale. To turn it into a minor, we're going to flat the third note. We're going to flat the sixth. We're going to flat the seventh. Guess what that gives us? Ladies and gentlemen, it gives us the ABCs. Now I have written the A minor scale. So for the record, in case there's some folks who are listening to this and not watching this, the A major scale, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, an A major scale, an A minor scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, with one more A at the end. See why I chose A major? And you know I chose A major because the net result of an A minor scale uh, is just the ABCs. And we love ABCs because it gives us a sense of, uh, like, you know, oh, ABCs, I got that. 
It's a familiar concept, right? If I had chosen any other major scale, the resulting minor scale would not seem quite so uh, familiar. So that's my way of thinking. Okay, so you take a major scale, you apply a formula, you get a minor scale. Okay, you guys okay with that? That is an example of turning a major scale into a minor scale, applying the necessary formula. We're flatting three notes. Um, by the way, when, when someone says to flat a note, let's talk about what that means for a guitar player. It means to play, it means to go backwards one fret. Let's say I'm playing C sharp as the ninth fret on your skinny E string, okay? If I flat that C sharp, instead of playing the ninth fret, I play the eighth fret. The eighth fret is the note C, or you could say C natural if you want to leave no doubt in anyone's mind, C natural. C natural just means C, you know? Okay, so I flatted the third degree of the scale. C sharp is the third degree of the scale. I moved it backwards one fret because that's what you do when you flat something and you get a C natural, okay? To flat a note means to move it backwards one fret. And I'm super glad I brought paper, nothing like blank paper and nothing like a big old, sh big old black permanent marker. Okay. All right, so excellent question. Um, I, <laughs> um, hey, Jerry Stillwell, I see your question. He asks, what is a choke? Please demonstrate. Um, I, I, need, I need another word for choke. Um, can you, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I don't, it's not a word I use. I've, in general, I've heard it in terms of guitar playing, but Jerry, could you, could you find another synonym for that word? Um, a to Z me is mentioning that um, says I only have a classical guitar, can't stand up the guitar. Is it made for a strap? Yeah, yeah. So number one, hey, go. It's it's the holidays. Go buy yourself another guitar. Why not? <laughs> you know. Number two, there are classical straps. Um, the old school kind I don't recommend because I don't understand it. It goes around your neck like a necklace, right? Doesn't go over your shoulder, under your arm. The classical strap I'm picturing, again, which I don't recommend because I, I don't get it. Around your neck like a necklace, it goes under the guitar and reaches up and clips onto the sound hole. I don't get it. I don't see how that, I guess, I guess your arm, your playing arm keeps the guitar from flipping forward. I don't get it. Um, classical guitars, you could, you could have someone install some strap buttons. Um, my concern would be, and I just talked to someone recently about this, is the strap button that goes on the, the end of the guitar, the butt of the guitar, way down low. Um, my concern is that there's, there may not be a good hunk of wood inside the guitar to hold that strap button. Um, uh, so I'm going to plead ignorance. Google it. Google, you know, installing strap buttons on a classical guitar and see. Um, or just buy, buy it by yourself a, um, a new guitar. Why not? Why not? Uh, I see a great question from Robert Becker. Robert says, I have a question about the boom, boom riff. <clears throat> in the first measure, it seems to call for a slide from D to A. But those notes are on different strings. So how is that done? Thanks and happy holidays. Thank you and happy holidays to you guys too. Um, Robert, I'm cracking open. The Song by Blues Guide ebook. Um, by the way, I, I printed this out at Staples. It cost me about 10 bucks because um, I like to have a spiral binding. I like the back and front to be kind of like thick cardstock, the cover and the back cover, about 10 bucks, which is not much money, right? Um, but it's not that big a book. So um, I recommend it, but you know, you don't have to go with the the thick cover and the spiral binding and stuff. Okay, Robert, I am, I'm gonna uh, talk about the boom, boom riff the way it, it is in the, um, presented in the Blues Guide. The slide, I'm gonna play it for a second. Two, three, four. <laughs> Take it nice and slow. Okay, the
the first, well, the, the only slides, there's two slides in this riff. And in both cases, the slide is on the third skinny string, also known as a G string. Um, there's that little slash mark that goes to the four. When, you, when you're doing a, a slide and the tab doesn't indicate where you should begin the slide, it just says, you know, slide and end up at four. That's because it's a fast slide, fast enough that the starting point is almost inaudible. Um, as opposed to a slower slide where they do indicate maybe like a two and a slash and a four. Hear the difference? You can hear that. Okay, so um, I think you're reading too much into the slash mark. <clears throat> it's just the G string, that's all. Um, you got to use your middle finger while I have your attention. Got to, if, if you're doing the boom, boom riff, uh, you got to slide with your middle finger. I happen to be starting at two, but that's a coincidence. I could start at one, I could start at three. And the, the second slide is a quick reverse back to two. So I hope that answers your question. I, uh, if, yeah. Um, Again, don't don't read too much into um, into I don't know the um, the exact look of the slide. It's just a slash mark. Um, so you're you're correct though. Um, you can't you you can't slide from from notes that are on different strings. So yeah, you're right. Whether you're looking at my book or someone else's book, yeah, you can't slide. You know that way. I hope that helps. Um, Stephen Mannion asked a question. Um, when you see a chord like, like E minor, like it says E with an M, how do you know if it's major or minor? That's a great question. Um, music notation is, is the Wild West. Anything goes. And by that, I mean <clears throat> different people can write things slightly differently from each other, which is unfortunate. And especially people who are, who are posting stuff on the internet, you know, who knows where they're coming from? So I can tell you, so I, can, I can give you a list of possible things and then what they mean. Okay, you ready? If it's just a capital E, it means E major. If it's a capital E with a little lowercase m, it means E minor, right? I think we can all agree on those two. What if it's a capital E with a capital M? It's weird, right? What the heck? You know, is it E minor and someone just put a capital M instead? Maybe, maybe. Is it E major and they feel like by making the M capital, we're supposed to know it's E major? Maybe. It's, it's not cool. <laughs> it's not cool to write that way. What if it's like a lowercase e? A lowercase e, could that be E minor? Maybe, maybe. Especially if you're looking at a chord, you know, progression, and there's some capital A's and C's, and then some lowercase E's or B's, maybe that means minor. So yeah, frustrating, right? Frustrating. Uh, at a certain point, you're left to trial and error, you know, play the major version, play the minor version, and, and, and trust your gut. You guys have heard me say that before, um, to, to trust your ear. And again, being adults, you've heard so much music. You have, you might not feel like you have a big head start on the guitar because of the physical challenges of playing the guitar. Um, but in terms of drawing on your musical memory, drawing on your instincts, believe me, I see adults do it all the time. I teach a lot of adult students um, and I've done that for many, many years. Uh, I, I'm very often I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm not even surprised anymore, but it's always a beautiful thing where it happens. When one of my adult students makes a decision, does something, recognizes something, plays something that clearly they're doing on instinct, not because I told them to do it. They just, they do it and they recognize it. And it's a beautiful thing. And rarely do my 11 year old students do that. My 11 year old students have other gifts. They're all, everyone's a, everyone is a unique, beautiful individual. But, um, but I see my adult students do it quite a bit. So, uh, okay. Um, I love all these questions coming in. Um, uh, Jerry Stilwell, um, getting back to that choke thing. I bet you're seeing it written out in a certain book. And now that I think about it, 
I've seen the word choke occasionally used to mean bending a string, which I guess I see the logic of it, um, choking the string, bending the string. Now, now that I think about it, that I've seen, I've seen it used that way. So I'm going to take an educated guess that the author of the book that they're using it to mean bend the string. Um, and I'm trying to think, is it Stefan Grossman? I've, I might be a Stefan Grossman book. Whatever it was, it was um, a book full of old school acoustic blues, like country blues playing. Um, that, that's the book I'm, I'm, uh, that's coming to mind that used that term choke. And it took me a minute to figure out, you know, what is that? So that's, yeah, you're not going to see it very often, that, that word. But I bet you anything. It means bending the strings. And if that doesn't seem quite logical to you guys, yeah, you're, you're right. It's a weird way to, to say bend the string, right? To say bend it, but you know, oh well. Uh, Gregory is asking a question. Um, coded versus non-coded strings. He said, I just had a pickup installed in one of my guitars and had coded strings put on. I think I may prefer the non-coded. Yeah, yeah. Um, coded strings are, are, are very cool. They're, they're different. Um, they don't get rusty and crusty as fast. Let's get that off the table. As promised, they last longer in that sense, you know. Um, I haven't played any for a long time, but I remember back in the late 90s when they, you know, elixir strings were becoming a big deal. You know, I paid the price. I mean, they're about double the price of, of regular strings. And um, and I, I tried them out and and they were cool. They were just a little too slick feeling for me. Um, now we're talking about specifically the four bass strings. So E, A, D, G, right? Because the two treble strings are, to my knowledge, just plain old regular steel strings. Uh, so I didn't love how slick they felt. Um, and I didn't love the price. Having said that, they sounded great. I mean, the sound was not an issue whatsoever. And they definitely lasted great. I mean, that. You know, I don't, I don't suffer from strings getting crusty and like that um, the way some people might, partly because I wipe them off. I try to wipe them off when I'm done playing. Mm -hmm. Any cotton cloth, anything like that would do it. <clears throat> and also just the, the pH of my finger oil is, um, doesn't lead to that. And I have come across students uh, in, my, in my day who, yeah, something is up where they're there. Their sweat, man. It's like, whew, they kill strings. I mean, yeah. And that's, it's, it's real. The struggle is real. Um, so yeah, if you haven't tried coated strings before, why not? You know, they cost a little bit extra, but in the grand scheme, considering what you paid for the guitar, you know, oh, um, hey, before I, before I, um, Before I get any further, I owe you guys a big thank you. Someone out there uh, uh, recently bought a beautiful Paul Reed Smith SE guitar, beautiful, and got themselves a guitar stand and a strap and uh, those cool amps called, I'm blanking out, those cool hip, um, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about, those cool hip amps that you you know you can put your uh phone you know as it comes with an app one of those cool amps you guys know what i'm talking about um was that you Chaz? did you buy that <laughs> um and they used my uh spark thank you many vibes um they used my sweet wallet water affiliate link you know, as their method of shopping at Sweetwater. And don't you know, as promised, Sweetwater made a donation here to our community here um, as a way of, of thanking me for providing the, um, the, uh, the affiliate link out there. And whoa, the system worked. So Chaz, if that was you, um, Chaz, awesome, awesome. This is a beautiful guitar, man, beautiful guitar. and. Uh, and I mean, you are set, and, you know, I don't know if Santa Claus, I think Santa Claus might be done with you, man. Don't, you know, no complaints if, you know, <laughs> um, uh, but listen, thank you again for using the Sweetwater link. And um, 
and enjoy that between the guitar, the amp. Uh, I think I saw you got a cool strap in there. <clears throat> nice. Awesome. So in light of that, you guys, I am putting this uh, affiliate link, bear with me. I'm putting it in the chat and I hope I get it right. Okay, I think I did. Um, real quick, if you guys are gonna shop at Sweetwater anyways, or if you're curious about what is this whole Sweetwater thing, um, imagine Amazon just for musicians, you know, only musical equipment and music related stuff, right? Uh, their prices are great. Customer service is beyond great. Um, and uh, they, they're really good at what they do. Um, and and I, I can't thank them enough for, you know, supporting what I do. That's fantastic, man. It's, you know, so, and, you know, just to be fair, like any big online business, of course, it's, it's the world we live in. It makes it tricky for the mom and pop shops because, you know, it's, it's tough to compete with a company that has great stuff at great prices and um, great customer service, right? It's tough to compete with that. Um, but here we are, you know. Okay, so bear with me, folks. I'm just double checking my uh, link here to make sure I typed it in right. I think I did. Okay, Sweetwater dot. dot okay, so that's nine. Uh, uh, oh, I put one too many letters. Okay, that's okay. I can fix that. Bear with me, folks. Yeah. Okay, let's try that one. Okay, so in the link um, uh, is in, in the live chat here is a link to that. By the way, um, my affiliate link to Sweetwater. So yeah, click it and check it out. And if you're gonna shop there anyways, you get the same prices, same low prices. Just So Chaz, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, just so you know, it's, um, you know, it helps. So I appreciate that. Um, Chaz, I think I saw that you got um, the Plex service, which I know a little bit about what that means. Some of you guys know about Plex, P-L-E-K. Um, long story short is it's a machine. It's a machine that takes a guitar and makes sure the guitar is set up perfectly, perfectly, you know. Um, uh, and it's a service I, I can see that Sweetwater offers the Plex service, and I believe, Chaz, you took advantage of that, and um, I, I'm sure it's a beautiful instrument, so thanks again. Okay, um, uh, Stephen Mannion, I see your super chat. Thank you, Stephen Mannion, that helps as well. A super chat, my friends, is your opportunity to make a little donation here. Um, it's that dollar sign down at the bottom of the screen, the chat, and um, Stephen, I thank you for your super chat. Okay, uh, you guys, um, here is, um, here's my dumb question of the day. Let's open up the floor to some dumb questions. Uh, uh, and I encourage you to think of a dumb question, some that you think, ah, I don't want to say it in front of everybody, but I am kind of curious, you know. Okay, so here's my dumb question of the day. I'm going to get things started. DQ, we call these DQ. Um, who started that? Uh, calling it DQ. Um, I know it was one of you guys. Uh, someone called it a DQ, and it took me a minute to realize that he meant dumb question. Okay, so here's my here's my dumb question: um, Is the piano easier than the guitar? What do you think? Is the piano easier than the guitar? There's no F chords on the piano, right? No bar chords on the piano. Piano, all you do is sit there and just bang on stuff with your fingers, right? Is it easier than the guitar? What do you guys think? Is the piano easier than the guitar? In fact, let's go crazy. Let's let's make it a poll question. Why not? Okay, don't don't go anywhere. Is the piano easier than the guitar? Now, some of you have played both, and you have a certain opinion. Okay, is the piano okay? There we go. Some of you have never played the piano. I assume that you guys are all guitar players here. Um, okay, the poll is live. Here's your chance to vote. Um, but you may have an, an heaven forbid that <laughs> you don't have an opinion, right? In this world that we live in, everybody has an opinion about everything, right? So you may already have, hey, Chaz, thank you for that super chat. I appreciate that. Um, 
some of you might, uh, I've never touched a piano and uh, you have no intention to because it looks too hard, you know? So what do you think? Is the piano, I'll give you my opinion. Um, it's, it's not going to be a, uh, it's not going to, you know, it's going to be a nuanced opinion. Um, but the fact remains that the stuff that we all struggle with currently or did struggle with at some point, like bar chords, the F chord, um, those are unique to guitar players. Again, piano players don't worry about that stuff. Why would they, you know? Interesting. Okay, so go ahead and vote in the poll. And uh, I think you guys can see the results um, the same way I can see them, but maybe not. But I will keep you posted on the results. So there's your poll question. There's my dumb question. Okay, um, I saw... I saw, Brian, I saw your question. I'm scrolling up, Brian, just to see if I missed someone else's question. Um, and by the way, folks, I always want to mention to you guys that if I don't answer your question, it's just possible I missed it. It's possible. Um, so, so feel free to put it in the chat again and say, hey, it's me again. Um, don't forget, a bunch of question marks. Go crazy. Five question marks. Why not? That, that gets my attention. Um, Brian is asking a good question. How often should you change the strings? It's a great question. Um, it, it depends, right? It depends on so much stuff. You really should do it a couple of times a year. I mean, just to be fair, even if you're not practicing six hours a day, a couple of times a year, you know, once a year wouldn't kill you. I'll tell you why people don't do it very often. Number one, it's intimidating. They've never done it before. Or they did it once and it took half a day and they broke three strings and they're like, ah, never again. I, I get that. Um, or the strings sound good enough, right? Like, oh, it sounds good enough, right? Why, why spend the money and change strings? I get that, you know? Um, but um, in general, strings kind of go south after a while, you know? Things to look for. It, number one, that crusty, rusty feeling, right? <laughs> that's, that's a dead giveaway right there. Um, a dull, muted sound, you know? How do you know if it's dull or muted? Well, you might not remember back to when they were nice and fresh, right? Um, but, you know, it's another giveaway. Here's something that I find so interesting scientifically. <clears throat> Old strings go sharp. Old strings tighten up. If you find yourself giving your guitar a tune-up, and every time you tune your guitar, you're always loosening the strings in effect. You know, I don't mean one or two. I mean, like, the majority of the strings, you have to loosen them to get back in tune. Yeah, it's because they're old, they're getting brittle, they're tightening up. Um, and that's definitely a sign. I mean, unless you like retuning your guitar a lot, that's definitely a sign to get new strings. Other sort of giveaways. <clears throat> if the color of the wound strings, the four fast strings, if the color of those strings is profoundly different on the neck of the guitar than the color of the same strings up at the headstock, where your fingers haven't been touching up there, right? Um, that's another giveaway. If you're getting that dull brownish gray look along the neck of the guitar, but up at the headstock, they're that pretty shiny bronze golden look. Yeah, I mean, that's another sign, another giveaway. Um, and even if you're not sure if it's time to put on new strings, when you put on the new strings, you stretch them out. Remember, give them a, give them a tug and stretch them out three, four, five times per string. Retune it each time. It's going to take a minute, you know, but you got to stretch those strings out so they stay in tune. The, the extent to which you love the sound of those twangy new strings, that's how often you should change your strings. If you love that new twangy sound, and a lot of us do, um, yeah, then, then have that, you know, experience that feeling even more often, right? Um, uh, so a couple of times a year, yeah. Now, there's some of you guys out there who are playing an hour a day, two hours a day, every day, right? At the same guitar every day. Occasionally, you might forget to wipe off the strings, you know, then yeah, maybe, you know, every month, every two months, not a, not a crazy idea, you know, you know, buy a 10 pack of strings. Um, always a great idea to have extra strings. I get the Diodario 10 pack. Each of the 10 sets is wrapped in plastic. So they're not going to go, they're not going to get stale or anything. Um, it's just great having extra strings around it. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's cheaper to buy 10 at a time, 10 sets of strings, 10 packs, or even three packs, um, because you can get them as a three pack. I like the Diodario EJ16. Um, uh, it's just nice having extra strings around. 
And you know, the more you spend, the more you save, as we say in my household. Uh, so that's my that's my two cents about changing strings. So don't forget, this is the moment for some questions. Now, if you have a question, that's a perfectly good question. Yeah, go ahead and ask that. Um, Jerry mentions wash your hands before playing. That can help them last longer. Yeah, yeah, nice clean clean hands. Keep a keep a nice cloth handy. Any cloth, cotton, nice old t shirt. Hey, speaking of t shirts, I got a new t shirt to show you guys. Um, but yeah, wipe off your strings when you're done playing. Okay, I am currently showing you my new t shirt from the Music Emporium, Lexington, Massachusetts, right outside Boston. Oh, I had a chance to visit them. Oh, last Saturday. Sorry, you guys. That's where I was. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I was out of town up in Boston uh, last week, Cambridge to be specific. And, um, and uh, my son had a great swim meet at MIT. Um, and so it was close enough for us to zip up there and uh, spend the weekend and watch him swim. Um, uh, uh, MIT, and who else was there? Uh, Rensselaer. Uh, Tufts was there, a bunch of, you know, New England area schools. And, um, and so we zipped up there to watch him swim. And I went to, and he did great. I love you, son. I'm very proud of you. Um, the Music Emporium, what a cool place. Holy cow. Uh, some, it, it turns out I have expensive taste. <laughs> Oops, I did not spend anything except i got a t-shirt um but ooh, i saw some nice guitars uh in the chat i'm going to i saw plenty of great stuff there but um one guitar in case any of you actually are santa claus um uh I, one guitar that caught my eye well two guitars that caught my eye were made by nick huber i put his name in the chat there n-i-k-h-u-b-e-r out of germany Ooh. I like both of his guitars that were at the Music Emporium. There was a black one that I liked the look and the sound. But there was a green one where I liked the look and the feel of the neck. And like most of us guitar players, the feel of the neck means everything. I mean, everything, you know. But if Santa dropped off the black one under my uh, Christmas tree, I wouldn't complain. Anyways, uh, the Music Emporium up there in Lexington, Massachusetts, what a cool place, beautiful stuff, tons of acoustics, tons of electrics. It's funny because guitar stores don't need a big footprint. I mean, a few hundred square feet, you can fit dozens and dozens and dozens of beautiful guitars in a, in a few, few hundred square feet, you know? Um, so uh, I recommend them highly. Um, here's one thing that was especially cool aside from their great selection of guitars, you go to try out an electric guitar and they plug you into a product made by Milkman. And it is basically, Milkman calls it the amp. It's essentially, I just put it in the chat there. It's a, it's a little, it's is it a it's a preamp slash pedal thing. Long story short, you plug your headphones right into it. At least that's what they did. And there's a bunch of great sounds. Um, and then you're trying out the electric guitar in the guitar store, but nobody hears it but you. Oh, it solves everybody's problem, right? You know, it was a, let me tell you, it was one of the quietest guitar stores I've ever been in. You know, now that Milkman device. It works the way I just described it. They had that plugged into a larger device called the Ox. Who makes the Ox? Is it Universal Audio? I'm sure some of you guys are going to tell me, but I'm going to try to beat you to the punch. Yeah. Okay. So the the Ox is essentially a larger unit, and some of you guys know what I'm talking about, the aux. Okay, so I said to the salesman, well, I'm already, I mean, can I just plug directly into the Milkman? And didn't say, because it sounded great. And he said, you can do that, but the Milkman, they had it, the Milkman going into the aux, which is just a larger version. Now there's no speaker involved, okay? So you guys get what I'm saying here? These are 
these are, you call it a head, a preamp, a pedal, whatever. Um, and the aux just had, had more options, but you could like tweak both of them to combine. Anyways, that was their setup. How cool. So I'm sitting there with headphones. I'm trying out a bunch of guitars and, uh, and yet oh, it was, the, the room was silent. How cool is that? I was not the only one doing this. Um, anyways, so uh, good news is now you got something for your uh, holiday wish list. Bad news is I hope your Santa is richer than my Santa because this, these are not cheap pieces of equipment. Um, the, the upper three figures and uh, getting into four figures. I know, I know. But, but um, if, number one, if you love great sound, number two, if you have the money, <laughs> number three, if, if you, you want to keep things quiet, you know, and, and play and not bug anybody, I mean, it, 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 it checks that box too. Both of these items check that box too. So the Milkman was about half the price of, of the Ox. Um, the Milkman, it was the 50 watt model. They make a 100 watt model as well. Um, now these are not just for practicing. You can play live with these things, right? You take it, either one of these, plug it directly into a cabinet, right? Just a speaker, no, not an amp, not a, not a combo amp, just a speaker, right? With a, you name it, a 12 inch, 212s, 410s, 615s, whatever, you know? And, um, you know, you record with it, just very cool. So that's my, I've heard about these devices. I just never tried them before. So that was my experience at the Music Emporium, Lexington, Massachusetts. And they were super nice. And I recommend it if you happen to be in the area. Okay, my friends, let's check on the poll and see how we're doing. I'm going to click on the poll here. Remember, the poll question was, is the piano easier than the guitar? 62% of you say yes, inherently. Inherently, the piano is just an easier instrument. But am I influencing you guys when I say, oh, you don't have to do bar chords. You don't have to do, you know, the F chord is no harder than the C chord or the, you know, you could say on the piano, all, all the major and minor chords are equally easy, right? Did I influence you by saying that? Okay, so just to be devil's advocate for you 64% who feel it so easy, the piano, you're talking about 10 fingers and 88 keys. How can you possibly think that's easier than the guitar? Are you crazy? Piano, man, all that 10, you know, it's insane. It's a massive instrument. You, you, you look at one hand, you mess up the other hand and vice versa. That's harder than the guitar, isn't it? Isn't it harder? Imagine doing chords with one hand and then melodic stuff with the other hand. Isn't that harder than the guitar? What do you think? Some of you are like, nope, nothing is harder in this world than mastering the F chord. Like some of you, I, I'm sure I can't convince. So what do you, what do you think? Um, you sure you're gonna stick with your answer? I don't know if you guys can go back and, and change your answer. Um, uh, and I do have opinions on this. Um, <laughs> Gregory says, I personally would be terrified of the piano. But then he says he came to this whole thing from being a ukulele player. Yeah, fair, fair question. Hey, Walter asks a great question, and this, um, uh, this is uh, something near and dear to my heart. Walter says, how important is it to cut the ends of your strings off after restring your guitar? It's incredibly important for one reason. <laughs> it makes me crazy when people don't do it. Um, so yeah, yeah, always cut your, the ends of the strings off. Although I've seen cool pictures of Jimmy Page with all the strings going crazy. I don't know if he's sitting backstage in the recording studio and the end of his guitar looks like a, a, something from a torture chamber, all those wires going every which way. Yeah, man, you know, keep those clippers handy, right? Cut those strings off. Um, is it important to do it? No, it doesn't change anything. Um, your guitar is gonna stay in tune no matter what. But come on, man, gotta clip those things off. Um, but yes, I admit, as long as you've strung your guitar correctly, all, everything being equal, um, yeah, you can you can leave those, you know, pointing out, you know, I guess in a way, you know, it keeps people away from your guitar and those are gonna get too close because they're gonna get there. You'll poke your eye out. Um, but yeah, do me a favor, man, get those clippers. You can even buy yourself guitar clippers, right? You know, at the hardware store, get yourself a pair of those $3 clippers or something, $5 clippers. Keep them in your guitar case. Um, yeah, why not? 
Um, Willie Snyder, Willie, thank you for what you're saying. Willie says, hey, John, I love the tip about bringing your elbow in, helping my technique. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm sure I'm not the first guitar teacher to mention this, but I usually bring up what Willie's talking about in the context of uh, the F chord, the four string F chord, or um, a, a bar chord, whether it's an F bar chord or any bar chord. And just to recap, the reason why I talk about bringing your left elbow, assuming you're a right-handed guitar player, your left elbow in towards the guitar, the context has to do with your index finger rolling over onto its side, which I 100% recommend anytime you, you're um, barring any number of strings, whether it's two strings, three strings, four strings, five, six, whatever. When you bar any multiple number of strings, you do not use the center it's called the pad, the center pad of your index finger. You don't, you at least you won't be successful doing it, you know. You roll the finger backwards. I call it rolling it backwards. And you use the edge of your finger. If I'm not being descriptive enough, I'm talking about the edge of your index finger closest to your thumb, right? You've got one edge that's close to your middle finger. You're not going to use that edge. You're going to use the edge closest to your thumb. And you can guarantee that you'll use the right edge or the right side of your finger. If you bring your left elbow in towards the guitar, you will naturally roll that index finger onto the edge or the side. It just gets a more consistent, confident rip um, by doing this. And that's going to make your F chord sound better, more consistently, your bar chords. Oh, yep. So, Willie, I'm glad that helped. Oh, you guys see some lights in the background there? Different vehicles going by. I believe this parade is wrapping up, although I'm still disappointed. I thought you guys were going to hear some uh, fife and drum cores. The, the fife and drum cores were a big part of this parade. You got to take my word for it. <sighs> okay. I'm proactively taking a, um, a sip. Our Today's program is brought to us by Triple X Vitamin Water. Vitamin Water with a Triple X flavor with uh, a blueberry pomegranate uh, flavoring. And the other flavor that's involved is the one I never know how to pronounce, acai. It's spelled A-C-A-I. Uh, it's good for you. But anyways, okay, checking out your questions here while I hydrate. Hmm. Uh, Jerry is asking, why don't I have my own t-shirts for purchase? Ooh, those are in the works. Um, I I just want to shop around and and get the best quality, you guys. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I can't wait. Uh, I have a, a couple of different song bike logos that I love. Um, I work with a friend of mine who's a pro, who you know I worked together and, and came up with the logos, including the logo that you see. See that song bike logo up at the top of the screen? You guys see that? It's white with orange letters. It's like a bicycle combined with a um, music notes instead of where the pedal should be it's it's music notes so yeah uh as you guys might know there are third party companies that will do all your merch for you right so instead of me investing in a thousand t-shirts uh you guys order through me and they print you the t-shirt and send it right to you which is great unless the quality is not great then we have a problem right because i it will not stand. So I just I'm just shopping around trying to find the um the the ones that get the best ratings and the best quality and the best customer service and all that kind of stuff. Because I've heard some some nightmare stories about you know people who just want a cool T-shirt to support you know whoever they happen to be wanting to support and what they get in the mail is is not quality. Can't have that, you guys. Can't have that. Um. Uh, Willie is asking, um, what is uh, your favorite brand acoustic and is it the same for electric? Uh, ooh, tough question. Tough question. I mean, number one, I should say uh, there's so many cool guitars out there. I mean, so many well-made, great instruments at all price points. Um, having said that, I really love my Martin acoustic guitar um, and I can foresee myself buying another Martin in the future. Um, but I certainly would shop around a little bit. Uh, I just, I always wanted a Martin. I tried out a bunch of Martins when I, you know, before I bought this one. So 
Um, but there's there sure are a lot of beautiful guitars out there. Um, and in no particular order, uh, the acoustic guitars, the new acoustic guitars. You guys know I love Yamaha stuff, Seagull guitars. I'm a big fan of Seagull guitars. Um, one of my students has an Orangewood acoustic that is his. It is great. Um, the more expensive ones, Breed Love, uh, Santa Cruz, um, the Gibsons just have never felt right to me. Sorry, Gibson. Don't send me any free ones. <laughs> if you were sorry, Gibson, no, you can get that off the UPS truck. Um, the, the Gibson neck just has never felt right to me. Um, that not just me. For electric guitars, <laughs> ooh, that's tricky because um, I, there's a, a major manufacturer who uh, I ordered a custom guitar from. You guys know this story. And I waited 20 months, and when the guitar finally arrived after 20 months, it was not to the specifications I ordered, and and they they made no effort to apologize or make it right. I shall not say their name. I used to really like their guitars, and uh, I just ended up getting my deposit back and uh, crying a little bit. Um, Extremely, extremely, extremely frustrating. I'll leave it at that. So, so I'm in the market for a new favorite electric guitar, um, and so, some, you know, for me, it, it starts with how the neck feels and the overall look. You know, I'm not a, I'm not an '80s pointy headstock kind of guy. Uh, the neck would have to feel amazing for me to get one of those guitars. You know. Um, uh, Gibson Les Pauls are just a little bit too heavy. I, I'm I'm not the only person who just doesn't feel quite right with a Gibson Les Paul. Just the heavy, heavy thing. So yeah. So in terms of electrics, I don't know, man. I'm shopping around. I'm shopping around. Um, obviously, Paul Reed Smith is like just dominating the market, man. And when I walk into a lot of a lot of stores, I mean, Paul Reed, Reed Smith is killing it out there. So clearly, whether I own one or not. They are clearly doing something very, very right. Um, Taylor guitars too. Taylor guitars clearly are, <laughs> they clearly know what they're doing. Um, I, I don't personally vibe with Taylor guitars. Um, they just have never felt quite right to me, but wow. I mean, it's hard to go wrong with a Taylor guitar. It's hard to go wrong with a Paul Reed Smith guitar, you know? So I don't know, those are some of my thoughts. Um, okay, I'm scrolling here, my friends. It's, you know what, it should be just about, oh, oh, um, Willie, your question leads me to one of my philosophical things I wanted to uh, talk about. And then um, maybe it's a time for us to do our, uh, our play along, sing along, because why not, right? Why not? Um, here is something that I want to talk about anyways, and just listing a bunch of instruments like I just did um, uh, leads me to this philosophical point that I'm going to throw out there. Um, when you guys shop for guitars, like Chaz did, like, like we all do, whether you're shopping for your first instrument or you've got your first instrument, now you're shopping for an upgrade or something like that. Here's something I want you to think about, uh, cause it's such a personal choice with so much emotion involved. Right. And we all like different things and value different things. Um, you want to get you ready. Look for the most inspiring instrument that you can get. The most inspiring, right? It's a personal choice. What inspires you? Okay, that's a good way to shop. You know, yes, you want things to feel right. You want to love the way they look. You know, what instrument is going to inspire you? You know, and we get, you know, we're all coming from different places here, you know, to get that guitar that your favorite guitar player uses. And now you've got it, man. That, whatever it happens to be, that's a good instrument to get, you know. So I, I want to I want to encourage you as you shop around to let yourself think that way. There's so many good instruments out there, right? You know, how, how do you possibly choose, right, at any price point? But I think that's a that's a, a healthy way and a fun way to look at it. What what inspires you? Whether it's something you've always wanted, or you walk into that store and you think, oh, "Holy cow, that is a beautiful instrument." I I, I want to look at that every day. And just knowing that that's waiting for me at home after work, I'm going to want to play that guitar. Yeah. Okay. Well, there. 
that helps the decision making process, right? It helps the shopping process. So that's, <clears throat> I just want to put that out there. Okay, so my friends, who recognizes this riff? I know you know this riff. It's going to be our play along. It's not ripple. <laughs> In the ballpark. Okay, so for today's play along, uh, I have a couple of ideas and I'm going to try something here. You know, it wouldn't be fun unless we went, went, uh, you know, just went for it. Let's go for it. Neil Young would want us to just go for it. What you just heard me playing was the basic riff for the Neil Young song called, who knows the name of this Neil Young song? It only has two chords, G and C. Uh, so what we're going to do here for this Neil Young play along, sing along song, a uh, couple things. This is your moment to show me your G chord that does not use your index finger, meaning a G chord with middle ring and pinky. This is why, for those of you who have worked in this G chord, today is the day. This is why you've worked so hard on that G chord, the middle ring and pinky G chord, because this song has tons of G and C. And for those of you who are looking closely, I'm hoping that I'm making it look nice and easy as I change back and forth from G to C. So what I'm talking about is ring finger, sixth string, third fret, middle finger, fifth string, second fret, pinky finger, first string, third fret. That's how I recommend doing G for this song. I know some of you are like, ah, I'll learn that later. I get it, but, but learn it, okay? Get good with it. Okay, so this song is nothing but G's and C's. Thank you, Neil Young, for writing a great tune. Chicago Todd knows it's the song called Unknown Legend. Um, that's going to be today's play along, sing along. Feel free to jump in with some harmonies. Um, uh, this is the moment where I get you guys all the information you need. Okay, don't go anywhere. And then in a couple minutes, we'll actually play the tune, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do here. This is the experimental part. Again, we are in our new Elm Street studio, ladies and gentlemen. That is why the internet is working. Hold on here. That's why the internet is working great. And that is why the look is a little bit different. Oh, this is gonna be so awesome. Okay, cover your ears for a second. It's gonna make a squeaky sound. Here comes a squeaky sound. Okay, not bad, not bad. Give me a second. Oh, I bet you guys can see that okay. Look at that. Oh, look at that loud and clear. Oh, I love it. You guys can see that, right? Okay. So this is the preparation for the play along. And then we'll do the play along. My friends, how about if we start with the, uh, look right there, right? <laughs> if we start with the intro riff, okay? For your pleasure, I put a tab right there. But I also put in the names of the notes. Because, hey, why not learn the names of the notes while we're at it? Okay, so here's what I wrote. Two, three, four. Okay, recognize that? Now, for our purposes, I just wrote that out simply, right? I didn't include chord strumming in there, you know, but... There's the bare bones riff. Of course, that's how the song kicks off. If you know the song called Unknown Legend, that's how the song starts. And then uh, uh, it comes in at least one more time in the middle of the tune. In fact, I know this might be a little bit hard to read, but see where it says intro riff. Hold on here. Right. Where are we here? Right there. Look at that intro riff. Okay. Um, so it comes in at least one more time. Now, let's get into this part. <clears throat> Lyrics and chords. What's tricky? What's tricky about this song as a teacher is that it's difficult for me to describe exactly when to change chords, except by showing you the lyrics. We've done other tunes where it's like four G's, eight C's, four G's, or whatever. It's very, um, you know, short and repetitive. 
this sequence is easy to memorize, just repeat the sequence over and over again. Not so much with this tune. So <laughs> we're going to do it anyways, but I understand that some of you are going to be like, crap, I, I, I didn't know it was time to change that C chord. Shoot, you know? So I understand. I get it. But it's such a good song. It only has two chords. And this whole thing, as you guys know, this whole thing is being recorded, right? It's being recorded. So, so that means you can go back and do this again and again and again. Let's hear again and again. Let's hear there's some applause. Oh, that's not the applause. But let's hear some real applause. Come on, people, put your hands together. All right, that's better. That's better. You know, <laughs> when I heard those crickets, you know what that felt like deep down inside? Okay, but so, okay, so you, you, uh, let's talk about one more thing because the chord changes are right there. Uh, but I understand you're going to have to like be on your toes to know when it's time to change to the G's and C's. I get that. I know. I know. Let's talk about one more thing down up strumming. What I'm going to do here is a nice constant stream of right hand down up strumming. I'm going to just illustrate this on a G chord. For the record, I'm holding my pick super loosely. Hopefully that sounds kind of feather light and simple. I'm not trying to be fancy. And here's my thought process. Because I want us to all have a successful play along right now, right? I want to I want to keep the right hand as repetitive and consistent as possible without throwing in all sorts of crazy rhythmic stuff or louder accented strums, you know, that can be for another time. But I want to keep the right hand strumming simple so that you and I and everybody can focus on changing to the, the left hand chords in time. Okay, are you ready? Of course you are, you know. Um, you will notice that I don't sing like Neil Young. In fact, there are going to be moments when I drop down an octave because uh, <laughs> that's how it has to be, my friends. It's just how it has to be. Um, but for the record, if I were if I were going to like perform this song, like at a coffee shop, open mic night, whatever, I would either change to a different combination of chords or I would uh, I put a capo on. I'm not going to do that right now because, hey, I want to do this essentially the way Neil Young strummed it or played it without changing the key. Because, hey, for all I know, you guys can sing just like Neil Young, you know? Okay, so let's do this thing. Uh, I am going to play the intro as written on the paper here, but I am going to put in those, um, those, the strumming in between. So that part, I am going to try to make it sound exactly like Neil Young, and hopefully you can jump in there too. After that, I'm basically going to play the song as written, okay? we got a, a, the intro, of course. we got a verse, a chorus. Uh, um, yeah, the intro riff, and then another verse and a chorus. What could go wrong, right? What could go wrong? Please sing along. Find a way to harmonize. Do what you can, um, and let's have some fun. Okay. Uh, whew. My hands are cold here in the Elm Street studio. No excuses, though. Let's do it. <clears throat> oh, I hear some noisemakers. Okay, the parade is wrapping up. I hear that honking. Okay, my friends. On the count of two, we're going to start off with that intro and then get, and then get right into that verse. On the count of two. Well, after the honking... I can be honking now. On the count of two, my friends. A one, two. She used to work in a diner. Never saw a woman look finer. I used to order just to watch her float across the floor. She grew up in a small town. 
never put her roots down. Daddy always kept moving so she did too. Somewhere on the desert highway, she rides a Harley Davidson. Her long blonde hair flying in the wind. She's been running half her life. The chrome and steel she rides, colliding with the very air she breathes. The air she breathes. An unknown legend in her time. And now she's dressing two kids, looking for a magic kiss. She gets the far away look in her eyes. Someone on a desert highway. She rides a Harley Davidson. Her long blonde hair flying in the wind. She's been running half her life. The chrome and steel she rides, colliding with the very air she breathes. The air she breathes. How do we do? How do we do internet? Nice. Okay, now for those of you who did it great and had a ball and every note was perfect, awesome. Awesome. But but for those of you who like, ah, I kind of got lost halfway through, I get it. Believe me, I get it. Let me just clank this music stand out of the way. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, but remember. Remember, it's all recorded, right? It's all recorded. It's a chance to go back and say, like, okay, now wait a minute. Like, I think I can figure out when to go to the G, when to go to the C, <clears throat> and so on. And again, I get how this song is a little bit of a departure from some of the other ones, not because it has a lot of chords, it only has two chords, but because um, for those of you who like to count and see the structure of stuff, this is, is not quite that way. In fact, in general, I don't like when songs are presented with lyrics and chords above because typically it gives no sense for any sort of structure. It just like you're just constantly chasing the chords and the lyrics, like, ah, here comes a C. Um, but for this particular song, I, I made a choice to present it that way. Um, we, we could revisit it in the future. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, all right, now we are looking at. Uh, we should probably wrap up pretty soon. Pretty soon. Um, I've covered some of the things on my agenda today. I've answered a bunch of questions. Um, Beginning guitar lessons is asking <laughs> for uh, a song next week. Beginning guitar lessons is our moderator, by the way. Um, he says next week, can we do crazy on you? You're talking about heart, right? Heart crazy on you. What a great song. Uh, you know, I'm trying to keep it to these simple, simple tunes. Um, Crazy on You is, is actually, in some ways, there's a, there's a bunch of things that are very accessible about that tune. A hey, Never Say Never. I'll have to revisit it. It's been a little while since I've looked at that tune. Uh, okay, how are we doing in the poll? Remember the poll question, my friends. 
is, is the piano easier than the guitar? And 62% uh, of you say, yeah, piano's easier. 38% say, no, it's not easier. Uh, so, uh, and we'll wrap up that poll and I'll give you, I'll give you some more of my opinions um, about that question in a little bit. Uh, Robert Becker says, I think piano is harder because they're both challenging. I have to learn the bass and treble clef, right? And recognize notes all over the keyboard. I will say learning some piano has helped my music knowledge. Robert, I like your attitude. Yeah, yeah. There's um, especially music theory. Music theory is more obvious on the piano. Things jump out at you at, on the piano in a way that they don't necessarily on any other instrument. Um, and piano, of course, is an extremely visual instrument, right? Uh, I, I will give you some more thoughts about my um, about the two. A to Z me says the violin is harder than the piano or the guitar. Oh yeah, don't get me started, man. The vibes, I I I still. I, I'm still sore from <laughs> from what the violin did to me. <laughs> I still own a violin. Um, I haven't given up yet. Chicago Todd says, hey, Jonathan, just purchased your Christmas book. Thank you, Chicago Todd. Looking forward to checking it out. I appreciate that. Um, you guys, I, um, I might take a moment to um, do a quick sales pitch on that Christmas book because uh, I love how that book came out and I want to get it into your hands or at least onto your computer screens. Um, so um, stick around for that in a, little, in a little bit. I'm scrolling down. I see you guys. I'm looking at your comments about your guitars, different things that you purchase, different things that you own. Nice. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Charlie Beagle, I see your, your pressing question. <laughs> Charlie Beagle wants to know, what is the difference between a violin player and a fiddle player, there's a joke in there. Um, there's multiple jokes in there, but uh, you know, to give you the sincere answer to your question, you know, a violin is what a classical symphony orchestra is made up of, violin players, right? And typically when people say fiddle, they're specifically talking about almost every other type of violin music that's not classical. Jazz fiddle, country fiddle, Irish fiddle, you know? Um, of course, the instruments are the same, but there's a lot of jokes. You know, fiddles tend to smell more like beer and cigarettes <laughs> than violins. Um, now, to be fair, since heaven forbid I miss an educational opportunity, <clears throat> it's extremely common for people who play the violin in non-classical situations to flatten the bridge a little bit, help them play double stops. So um, imagine the, a violin bridge. For us, the it's the, like the saddle, right? The, the exact thing that the violin strings rest on, except it looks a lot different than what we have. But it's a you know, curved piece of wood, right? Very thin, almost fragile. Uh, it's common for fiddle players to want that curved violin bridge to be flattened out a little bit to help them with their bow, to help their bow play two strings at the same time. Um, so that's a, a physical a physical difference between the two because in general there's not a physical difference between the they're, they're, they're violins they're fiddles it's the same thing violins can be really expensive fiddles not so much necessarily but you know what i don't know anything's possible okay uh here's a quiz question for you test your folky knowledge many of you have heard of elizabeth cotton elizabeth cotton uh wrote the song freight train and introduced that song to, to American culture. And many, many, many of us learned Freight Train as, a, as our first finger-picking song, or one of our first finger-picking songs. Right, alternating thumb back and forth. Uh, many of you know that Elizabeth Cotton was left-handed, but played a righty guitar. So where I was bouncing back and forth with my right thumb on different bass strings, she would have been doing that with her index finger and picking up the melody with her thumb. Crazy. I mean, it's, it's crazy if you've never done it before. Um, many of you know that Elizabeth Cotton worked for Pete Seeger's family. In fact, they 
they didn't know at first that they had a guitar uh, player of her caliber um, on their household staff. The fam- Pete Seeger, the famous folk singing family, you know. Um, so here's something that you might not know. How did the Seeger family happen to hire Elizabeth Cotton to be a member of their household staff? Anybody know? I just learned this recently. You know, it's like the plot thickens just when you thought you knew everything. Anybody know how Elizabeth Cotton got the gig? How did she get the gig? And then I believe they, they, you know, they heard her, they overheard her plucking out, you know, playing a guitar in the other room. I said, we didn't know you played the guitar and the rest is history. Okay, anybody know? Uh, so go ahead and put that in chat. Okay, maybe now it's time to call it on the poll. Get your last votes in. We have 29 votes here, 30 votes. It's your last chance to vote. Give you 10 more seconds, okay, in the chat. 10 seconds countdown. Is the piano easier than the guitar? Uh, it's, it would take a lot of votes to upend, upend this, uh, this election. Um, so I think it's fair to call it <clears throat> with 30 votes being cast. I think we have a clear winning answer. And the yeses have it. 63% of you feel the piano is easier than the guitar and 37% feel otherwise. So there's the, there's the results. Um, what do I think? Uh, I think the piano... Mm. I think the piano is easier than the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, it's easier. Now, to become world-class on either instrument, that's, that's another story. But I'm going to go with the piano being easier than the guitar in a physical sense. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Only one problem, and it's a big problem. Without a doubt, progress on the piano, more than on the guitar, progress relates to your ability to read music. There's no such thing as tab for the piano. Tab is pretty easy, right, folks? Lines and numbers, tab is pretty easy. You know, especially if you basically know how the song goes. There is no equivalent for the piano. Can, can you figure out stuff on the piano without lessons? Of course, you know. Your name would be Paul McCartney, <laughs> for example, and, and tons of songwriters who, um, you know, wrote some of their songs on piano without any piano lessons. But, but uh, guitar, you can take a bunch of guitar lessons, learn a bunch of stuff, learn from YouTube, all sorts of stuff on the guitar and never read any proper music. You, you can do that to some extent in the piano, but so much... So much of typical piano education is, is, relates to specifically being able to read piano music, treble clef, bass clef, two different things at the same time. That, that could be, that could be um, a huge game changer. So I'm gonna say the physical skill needed to play the piano is not as, as uh, challenging as the physical skill in playing the guitar. You know, given that choice, I'm asking myself the same question I asked you guys. Uh, but um, if you were to show up for your first piano lesson, you would 99.99% of the time be asked to start reading music right away. Um, and it's far less likely that your first guitar lesson would involve reading any, let's call it real music, not tab. But it's, it's much less likely that your first guitar lesson with a guitar teacher would have you reading the equivalent music on the piano. Um, and possibly you would never read it. Brian O'Donnell. Brian, you, uh, you got the right answer to the question. Let's make sure I press the right button. Brian, this is for you. <laughs> Brian knew. Okay, okay, quiet. <laughs> Brian knew that uh, Elizabeth Cotton got the gig working for the Seegers because one of the Seeger children wandered away uh, from, the, from the family on the streets of Washington, D.C. You might be right, Brian, yeah. And Elizabeth Cotton found her and brought her back to her family, and they said thank you and gave her a, a, a gig. Um, and that's how Elizabeth Cotton got the job. You know, life, right, life. 
Um, so that's the Elizabeth Cotton story right there. Okay, so my friends, it is time to talk about the Christmas book. We have just a few minutes left. Hey, I want to thank you guys for sticking around. Um, uh, we got off to a slightly rough start today, but then we made it happen. And, uh, and I appreciate you guys bearing with me here. Um, uh, next week, I bet we can do even better next week. I bet we can even start. Uh, at the moment, I'm going to plan on a 5.30 start next week as well. Okay, so unless you hear differently, let's plan on a 5.30 start with no technical difficulties um, next, uh, next uh, Saturday. Because I think I know famous last words, but I think I know what went wrong this week. I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, but let's take a look at the Christmas stuff real quick. And... Uh, I'm going to pick a short, oh, maybe Old Lang Syne would be nice. That's in this book because, let's face it, Old Lang Syne is a, is a winter classic, right? Okay, so it's not officially a Christmas song, but you get, you get where I'm coming from. Old Lang Syne, the New Year's Eve melody to end all melodies. Okay, so why would anybody invest in the complete Christmas songbook. Okay, here's why. You take a song, like Old Lang Syne. There's the melody. For some of you, that is a challenge because you just got your guitar yesterday and just to pluck out one note at a time, smooth and steady all the way through with a nice rhythm, that is enough of a challenge. Great. Some of you might say, you know what? I want to be prepared on New Year's Eve. And I want to sing Old Lang Syne. Gee whiz, I hope Jonathan included the chords and the strum pattern and all the lyrics. Of course I did. Of course I did. In fact, see that two in parentheses at the very, very beginning of the tune? That's the note the melody starts on. So just to guarantee that you're singing it in the right key right from the very start, there's your melody note right there. You can see Old Lang Syne is presented here. Uh, it's, in the key of, uh, it's in the key of D. Um, <laughs> uh, got D chords, A chords, G chords, a nice strum pattern. There's a nice boom chicka strum pattern with all the lyrics. You might say, wait, all the lyrics? Of course I got all the lyrics for it. I got them right there. In fact, you could, even, you could even print out the lyrics and pass them around to everybody and everybody could have a good old sing along. Not just the first verse, not just the second verse, but all three verses. I bet you didn't even know Old Lang Syne had three verses. Some of you might say, well, what if my buddy and I both have our guitars? And we want to put on a little show. Well, guess what? One of you does that strumming right there, right? And the other person picks out the melody, that nice easy melody right there. You got a duet going on. Easy peasy, right? Some of you might say, oh, I am an experienced guitar player. I'm not just going to pluck out the melody. I'm not not just going to strum the chords. I want to perform. I shall perform. Well, then you want the third version. Everything in the book comes in three versions. And the third version, the chord melody arrangement, right? Where, like it, you know, as promised, the melody occasionally supported by chord tones. Is it harder than the other two versions? Yep. Yep. A little bit. Can you do it? Totally. Totally. You know, everything is all in tab. Um, so there's 31 songs in the book, each one presented three different ways. There's a video that covers everything in the whole book. This book can be yours as an e book, an electronic book. That means you get it instantly. How do you get this book? You get it by going to song bike.com. I just put that in the chat again. Uh, did I do it right? I think I put a comma in there. And you, here we go. That's better. Um, and it's delivered immediately to your email inbox. Um, you might say, ah, but I wanted the, the actual physical book. Believe me, I would love all you guys to have exactly what I'm holding right here. It's just that it cost me about 50 bucks to print this out the way I like it. And that's just a 
that's a lot, you know, as a retail product. But hey, save a tree. Just print out the songs you're working on. You're all set. You can print it out yourself for less than that amount of money um, if you don't go with the whole spiral binding and the thick cover and all that stuff. Okay. Um, if you have any questions about how a song goes, guess what? That's what the video is for. Now, some of you know what I'm going to say. Here it comes. There we go. For a limited time, what do you get with a Christmas book? Before you answer, remember those commercials? You know, wait, there's more. Everybody who buys the Christmas book gets the blues guide, the songbook blues guide for free. Woohoo! In fact, that's the only way you can get the blues guide um, now. Uh, um, probably in the new year, I'll make it available as a standalone product. But um, you get it with your Christmas book, you know? So I talked about this book earlier in the live stream, you know. So there's my sales pitch. Thank you for listening. All right. Now, I think I, I'm looking at my whole list. I think you guys, I think I talked and talked and talked. You guys are so patient. Um, it's almost time to wrap up. Almost. Uh, Chicago Todd. Hey, thanks. Chicago Todd says the Christmas book is set up nicely with the different aspects of each song. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put a lot of work into that. <laughs> I put a lot of work into that Christmas book. Um, and I'm really happy with how it came out. Um, so um, I'm scrolling. This is your last chance, my friends, last chance for any questions. Or if you ask a question and I missed it somehow, just remember to put a bunch of question marks in advance of your question. So I know. Um, uh, Willie, I see your question here. Willie says, uh, John, I recently bought a 12 string acoustic guitar. I got the warranty. Now it sounds like the action is too low, hitting the frets, the higher okay, bridge. Okay, now what's wrong? Um, uh, good news, good news. Everything is repairable. You know, everything's repairable. And hey, if if the if it's under warranty, then sure, it's it's certainly worth you know bringing it to the attention of where, wherever you got it and and saying you know showing them what's going on. Um, uh, twelve string guitars are under tons of pressure, tons of stress. So they are more um, vulnerable than a six-string acoustic guitar. Um, they require just a, a lighter, just, just they require attention and they, they require um, monitoring, you know, just, you know so, so it's good. It, whatever you're noticing now, at least you're noticing it now, not a year down the road. Um, so uh, it's, it, it, whatever it is, I bet you it's, it's some that can be solved by a guitar tech um, making a few adjustments. Uh, in a perfect world, you shouldn't have to pay anything for it. The guitar probably just settled in, you know, um, that uh, you didn't mention about how long you've had it. Um, but if you've had it for a few months, then for sure, for sure, you said you recently bought it. Um, but even if you only had it for a week or two, yeah. Um, it's it's getting used to your house, your humidity or lack of humidity, your um, you know, so uh, your takeaway. What I want your takeaway to be is everything is repairable, and sometimes maybe repair isn't even the right word. It's more like adjustments. You know, um, in fact, it'd be a miracle if your twelve string guitar didn't need some adjusting here and there. Um, when the action is super low. To the point where the strings are hitting the frets, you know, and buzzing when you don't want them to, you know. My knee-jerk reaction is that the neck is either perfectly straight, which believe it or not is not what we want. We want a tiny bit of a bow, like a smile, you know, um, or potentially the neck is is bowing is uh is going in the wrong direction. It's got a hump in it. Um, but this is all adjustable stuff. That's why guitars have a truss rod embedded in the neck, you know. Um, so that's my first reaction. The neck is, is not bowing in the right direction, you know? Um, so yeah, it's all, it's all fixable. Um, and I, and I hope that wherever you got it honors the warranty and, you know, um, and takes care of you and they should, should. And congratulations on the 12 string. I mean, as you know, Willie, it's a, when, when, when it's working, it's a beautiful, beautiful sound. There's nothing like it. Um, oh, one thing I saw, and I didn't try it. 
when I was at the Music Emporium in Lexington, Massachusetts, uh, they had a Grez brand guitar, G-R-E-Z. Um, and it was an electric 12 string that looked so cool. And I just, you know, I didn't, uh, there's, there's just lots of, uh, you know, too many guitars, too little time. And, um, you know, heaven forbid, I actually fall in love with one and then I have to start saving up for it. That would make me, that, that's a tough way to go. Um, hey, hello from Poland. Kraken, I, I'm sure I'm not saying your name right, but um, thank you from, all the way from Poland. Thank you, Kraken, for, for joining us. <clears throat> so, um, 12 string guitars, yeah, 12 string guitars. Worth the effort, but just know before you get one, just know that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, uh, to take a little, it's like a high maintenance pet. You know, some pets are low maintenance, some pets are high maintenance, and, and a 12 string is, is, I would describe it as high maintenance, you know. Uh, hear that parade float? Kind of noisy back there. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think, I think, uh, I think now is a good time to begin our good nights. Um, some of the sound effects that you didn't hear. Let's see what this one was. Not bad. Ooh, that was loud. Okay. Okay, that's enough of that one. I don't know about that one. All right, kind of like that one. Oh. <laughs> A skeleton walks into a bar and says to the bartender, I'll take a beer and a mop. Uh, we did hear this one. I believe we heard that one. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the wild applause. Okay. I'm going to try not to abuse the buttons at my disposal all of a sudden all right my friends uh next week let's do this again knock on wood we will start at 5 30 eastern time sharp with no technical difficulties thank you for being part of uh the debut live stream from my new elm street studio where the internet is bulletproof and uh what else thank you in advance should you use the sweetwater affiliate link thank you for those of you who made uh super chat donations thank you to those of you who have purchased one of my ebooks or who are now considering purchasing the christmas ebook with free blues guide ebook uh and countdown uh, the christmas is coming you know, I would love for you guys to create a beautiful holiday moment should you be so inclined by, you know, having the songs now to practice. Here we are, December 9th. And then having them sounding great, at least one song sounding great by December 24th, 25th, 26th. Okay, my friends, saying goodbye is the hardest part. And yet, here we are. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you next Saturday. Uh, more videos to come on my agenda is a video that shows, you know, every example uh, from this book. And so that's going to be coming up very soon, I hope. Okay, my friends, I say a couple quick good nights. Uh, Willie, good night. Jerry, uh, beginner guitar lessons. Thank you for being our moderator. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Sam. Uh, Chicago Todd, Kraken Charlie. Good night, you folks. I see we have 24 of you viewing at the time. Uh, Stephen Mannion, if you're still here. Sam, <laughs> thank you for being here, everybody. Okay, dinner time. Dinner time here in Connecticut. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>